Jesus here. Amen. <laughs> I just feel that. Uh, there may be some, I of course don't know you well, and you, you know me better than I know you, some of them. <laughs> but I think there are probably some of you now that are wondering, what's this guy really like? You know, you're wondering if you're going to get out late or early or... <laughs> I'm just a real person. Can I be like right down to earth real quick? How many are okay with that? A moment ago, I thought I could sneak out on the last song and use the restroom. <laughs> and, uh, and then I thought, no, I shouldn't because if I leave that urgency in place, you'll be out on time. <laughs> this isn't going to be posted to the internet or anything, is it? You and I will negotiate later. <laughs> I'm really thrilled to have Peggy with me today, my bride. 36. She's put up with me for over 35 years. Yes. And that doesn't count the getting to know you years, which was a couple. And, and uh, but it's great to be with her, with me, with you. Seekers of Jesus, lovers of Jesus, and some that maybe are just kind of wondering what's Jesus really like? And do I want to hang out in this particular group of people at First Baptist Church, Crestline? Let me just answer the question for you if you haven't answered it. You need to hang out with these people. <laughs> you know, and they'll be as strange and odd as you and that's one of your fears, maybe, is will they be, what will they be like? There's a story of a family that was moving from one town to another, and as they were, they were nervous about it, and there was, they were driving into the town, they saw uh, a gentleman out at his front fence, and they just pulled over and said, Sir, could you tell us we're moving into town here? And I just kind of wonder, what, what are the people like here? And the man leaned against his fence and said, Well, tell me, what are the people like where you're coming from? And they said, well, you know, we're moving because those people are just cantankerous and they're hard to get along with. You can't do business in town. It's difficult. And it's just always been a struggle for us here. We don't have many friends. And so we're going to try something new. We thought we'd move here. And he says, well, I'm pretty sure this town's got the same kind of people. I'm sorry. Next family drives by, same guy pulls over, of course, as the story goes, say, hey, we're moving into town, and what kind of people live here? So what kind of people live where you came from? Oh, we just hate to move. And people love us. They, we have such great friendships, and our, our business was going well. We, we just have to relocate, but we just didn't ever want to go from there. He says, you're going to be really pleased to find that the same kind of people live in this town. You know, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? If you're coming in and you're nervous, say, I'm not sure about that group there. Well, they're not sure about you either. <laughs> All right? You know, it's a small enough town we can check each other out often. Is that correct? Is that correct? How many of you like to shop, ladies? Do you like to do your shopping off the mountain? Right? Because you never stopped in the store to have to talk for 45 minutes with the... It's faster to go down the hill, shop, come back, than to check out every aisle. Oh, man, that's going to be a 30-minute talk. <laughs> I'm going to produce, quick. Well, I can't use up all my time telling stories. I did that last time I was here. When pastor wasn't watching. He's here today, so I'm going to straighten up fly straight. Thank you for the worship team this morning. Now, I know that worship styles vary in churches and this is different than our, our church and but I loved it this morning. You know, you're, you're on target with the words. You're on target. I thought, well, I could just pull the worship sheets and preach from them <laughs> as we've been known to do in a pinch. Why? Because the, the focus was right. Maybe the music and the style is different for you or this is your perfect style and you hope it never changes, whatever your view is. The worship team was helping us get to where we need to go. 
you know, they drive a pretty large piece of the vehicle every week. You know, they, you think about, they get about half the time, the, this oddball from Big Bear gets the other half, and we're sharing it, but they need to convey us to a place where our hearts and our rhythm is saying, God loves us. I mean, they're not telling us out there, God loves us. On our jobs and in our schools and in our day-to-day, that's not the encouragement we often get, that somebody really cares about us. So when we come here and they help us with these songs and with these, the content of these songs to remind us, Jesus really does care about my life. He's focused. He's not forgotten my name. He knows my address. And even more than that, he is not distant. Two words that describe God for me. One is transcendent. Oh, there are all the words describe God, you know, but just in this moment, transcendent. He's over everything. He says in the word, he's in all, he's, he is all, there's nothing bigger than him. He's transcendent, which kind of feels distant. The other word is eminent. He's right here, right now. One of the things that I've been learning as I've learned to share the word of God and share hope with people is that we don't, I don't want to preach or talk like he's out of the room. There's a tendency for us to do that. We're going to, they say the pastor's job is to stand before God and talk to him about men. And then when we're done, come and stand in front of men and talk to them about God. And this sort of priestly function. I don't know. Right? We do that. I don't want to get trapped in the role that says you don't know him too that he's somewhere distant and I'm going to come and usher him in so you can see what he looks like. No. He is imminent. He's here. He's as close as your next breath. In fact, his promise is Christ in you is the hope of glory. Jesus is alive in the earth because he lives in his body and you are his body. So I don't know how many are visitors. I'm not one of those preachers that says all the visitors stand up and be embarrassed, please. <laughs> I mean, we got name tags just in case. This house is helpful. My wife called me by my right name. <laughs> I, I, mean, I just went into trouble. I felt that. Did you feel that? The ladies felt that. that man, he's, he's in trouble. Okay. So the Bible says, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, Mildred. <laughs> if I pick on her, she won't come back. Huh? When the scripture was read earlier, and that's where I'd like to start, I'm not sure what's, I think maybe it'll be listed here. I'm not You don't have to keep up, of course, but Romans 8, 18. This is the New King James Version. It says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Suffering? You know, there's a word in the Bible that says long suffering. It's one of the good things. You know what it means? In the heavy Greek interpretation of that word, long suffering, it means long suffering. That's it. You're going to suffer for a long time. Jesus said in the world you have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He said, my peace I'm leaving with you. Not the kind that the world gives, but my peace. Resident, I'm going to live in you and bring you peace. Peace is a great commodity in the kingdom of God. The world is in trouble. I encourage you to not watch the news. Right? Right? Uh, it doesn't take long. We've talked about that, I think, before. But I consider that the sufferings of this present world and this present time are not worthy to be compared to what's coming. This is a view. Paul the Apostle had it. He shares it with us, his heart. I'm suffering. Paul the Apostle? Shipwrecked all those times, beat up with rods, rods, stoned to death, basically, and brought back. He knew about suffering. 
He said, in my sufferings, they're not even worthy to be compared to what's coming. I titled the message, Settle Your Heart, and I have to tell you the picture that I saw when I, I'm not big on titles of messages, but Pastor Bill had me get one, you know, <laughs> and uh, there it is. And I thought, I wonder what this word consider means. Now, what does it say in the New International? Somebody has that. Maybe it's a different word for I consider. Yes, consider. Says consider? Good. It comes from the Greek word logizomai, and, or logizomahi, if you wish. And it's where we get the word logic, right? It means to calculate, figure out, decide between a couple of things. Put all the information you have into the system and sort it out. And when you get all done, you'll have some in the credit column and some in the debit column. It's like an accounting thing. <coughs> Settle it, consider it, figure it out. Compute it, reckon it, reason it, draw a conclusion. And here's the picture that came to my mind. Maybe it's not the one you would get, but remember when they landed the, the lunar module way back? I'm an Apollo 13 fan. I mean, I've seen the movie like 50 or 60 times. And people walk into the room and start talking to me, and I say, stop, stop. I want to see if they make it back. <laughs> I still wonder. I'm a male, and we can do that. We compartmentalize. It's like, wait, will they make it? But when they land that gizmo, you know, it's drifting down, and the jets are blowing, and Things are a little uncertain, it looks, but it, you, you saw it, you know, kind of wiggles and wobbles and then finally gets right down there and, and says, we're here. And that's really what Paul the Apostle said. Listen, settle your heart. Quit drifting all over the place. You're looking a little shaky there on your landing. Get your legs down. Go ahead, wobble a little bit. Settle it down. And he, I'm saying settle our hearts. I'm thinking of us as, as a representation of our God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who lives in a triune community in complete agreement and support to one another. And you are built like him in spirit, soul, and body. And when I say settle your heart, I'm talking about your spirit. I'm talking about the real you, the born again part of you that Jesus came and made alive when you called on his name and he forgave your sins and said, I'm going to live inside of you and you were born again. And I encourage you this morning, if you're here this morning, that experience is not yours. You've not, you say, I'm, I don't think I'm born again. Take care of that today here. Ask Jesus into your life. Let him bring you to birth because you're triune, spirit, soul, and body. And if you don't know Jesus, the spirit side of you has never come to life. You are like a walking dead person. You're living in the soul and the, and the body realm without the life of God who promised to forgive your sin, separate the distance between you and him, and then come and live within you forever and take you to be with him in heaven. Golly, that just sounds good. Can we go today? Let's go. Let's just go. Can we do like that one pastor who said, how many want to go to heaven? You remember this story? And they reached into the pulpit and pulled out a 45. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Well, we're not that serious about leaving. We do want to go when it's time, but we're not in a hurry. Settle. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what, what's it here for? <laughs> if we can settle our heart, and I'm trying to put it in the right order, because we are spirit first, right? Soul next, body last. We settle our spirit, then we can quiet our mind. Whew, it's busy in there. This moment this morning, Pastor, when you said, let's just take this moment out, do you do that regularly? We stop and just, shh. Man, you're blessed. I mean, if you're missing that moment or you're just tapping your foot, wondering, what is this about? I don't have to be so quiet for so long. For me, I think maybe that was the first time in about the last five days. 
guys, don't we get busy? We're just going all the time, doing busy. We get one thing to the next. And <clears throat> I say guys because I'm talking to men. Wives, I know you don't think we're that busy, but we are busy. We're legends in our own mind, maybe, but we're busy. <laughs> we're doing something. And to just stop and, and, and invite us and to, to be quiet before the Lord, pray, write down your need. Wow. This is why men fall asleep in church, by the way, just to that end. This is, you know, they work hard all week. They're out there, you know, and sweaty and stinky, and they're taking their showers, and they work and do it. And they come here, and they get these chairs. <laughs> nice warm atmosphere. It's like the first time in the week they've sat down and they go, This is nice. <laughs> it's not my fault. I'm not taking the blame. We settle our heart, we quiet our mind, and in that situation, then we can actually walk in peace. It's not what we want. And I consider that the sufferings I'm going through right now in this present moment just aren't, are not worthy. I need a longer view than the end of my nose. I, uh, we need to develop a picture, a world view, if you will, that's out there further than right here. We all have needs. We all have problems. We, Jesus promised we would. We can't deny that they're going to hit us. Five times, bad patient in the hospital over here, your friend. Yeah, I like the way that he picked on you. It was good. <laughs> Somebody needs to get picked on. But when we're, when we're myopic about our situation, myopia, that nearsightedness, you know how myopia works? Some of you may have it, nearsightedness. It's that the light that enters the eye focuses just ahead of the retina, evidently, instead of on the back, on the retina. So everything is out of focus if it's close. But the further out, it gets sharper. And I want to suggest to us this morning that we need to get rid of that myopia. We need to get a sight that's focused out there. Proverbs 29, 18 is not an uncommon passage for a lot of us. It says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Or where there is no vision, the people perish. You've heard it. You know, the longer definition is when you don't, well, I think I have it here. The Message Bible says, if people can't see what God's doing, they stumble all over themselves. If you can't see further out, things right here get pretty bad. In, directly in front of us, things are difficult to deal with. What did Jesus say, John 14? Don't let your hearts be troubled. Quiet your spirit. Quiet your heart. Don't let your heart be troubled, but it is, Lord. It is troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Forever's coming. Our hope is secure. We sang this morning about the promises of God they will always come through. He is not a man that he should lie, the Bible says, nor the son of man that he should repent. He doesn't change his mind. He isn't fickle like we are. Am I talking about the Jesus you're serving? The one who lives in you? He's not fickle. He decided, you know why God loves you? Do you ever wonder why God loves you? I found the answer. Because he decided to. He just chose to. I've asked him so many times, why do you love me? Why me? Especially in those moments when you all raised your hands, I thought that was pretty bold. Like, how many of you got recurring sins? Oi, me. <laughs> I was in a meeting one time where there was a professional thief. He was a con artist, and there were 500 people in the room, and he had just explained how he could take your credit card and in a matter of minutes strip it of its information and use it to buy whatever he wanted. And then he said, so how many of you have credit cards? <laughs> we all raised our hands. 
Like, and he just laughed. He said, boy, this is a great group of suckers here. I just told you I could take all your information and do whatever I want with it, and you told me you've got them. Well, you just bring them on up. <laughs> but we say, how many of you have reoccurring issues in your sin life? Oh, that's me. I got problems. Yeah. We've got problems. But he has peace. He grants us his grace. It says, I know you struggle. Not only do I know you struggle, do you ever get the idea that when he's living inside of you, he goes through the struggles with you? And I've taken him through some incredibly not good stuff, right? Just, and then at the end of it, say, in my reoccurring compulsive nature, God, why not just lightning bolt me out of here? Why do you love me when I'm like this? And his answer was simple. Because I chose to. And I'm God. I can do what I want. I love you. You can't fight that. Well, we do. But I love you. I chose to love you. You'll always be mine. You've given me your heart. I'm not giving it back. You Now you can count on me every day, all the time. And I'll be dwelling inside of you. I think I shared this last time I was here, learning from the Presbyterians. Some of them are okay. <laughs> I've talked to them. They think some of the Baptists are all right, too. <laughs> but neither one think the Pentecostals, you know. <laughs> They're scary. Well, she's, she's, I knew she was one. The Presbyterians have a, have a tradition, I understand, that when they come in the door or they're getting ready for their service, they say, the Jesus in me greets the Jesus in you. Have you ever run, the, in, run into that? I, I didn't know that. And I thought, what a great greeting. Because it's so true. The body's now collecting. The parts are coming into place. We're going to be together this morning. And we're going to experience his life together. The Jesus in me greets the Jesus in you. It's an, it's an affirmation of truth that I didn't come here empty, even if I'm in trouble. Even if life is bad, he's coming in with me. Everywhere I go, he goes. I have nine pages of notes. I'm on page two. <laughs> and I remember that clock was wrong last time I was here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Seriously. When trouble comes and we're close focused on the problems, we can't see, we have that spiritual myopia that limits our view. Or in some of the songs you used this morning, and I'm not familiar with these songs, most of them, but the idea of clouds making things uh, not visible. I can't quite see what's happening. I'm lost in the fog. Wow, I came out of, I was in Los Angeles yesterday, and I came out of my hotel late to go where I needed to go, and when I came out, it was so foggy that I couldn't see from here to the back wall. I couldn't find my car in the parking lot. I was like, where's my car? And I thought, I'm going to jump on a freeway and go 60. <laughs> sure you are. And I'm already late. This is terrible. But our, our, our vision is occluded, and we, we don't know. It's, it's things like, wait, Jesus is off working on a place for me. I will go there. Whatever happens today, even... Like the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, we've already decided that our God is able to deliver us. He can take care of this problem for me. And even if he doesn't, throw us in the fire. It's okay. We know, like Paul the Apostle, I know in whom I have believed. Philippians 1, 6. And I am persuaded. This word persuaded comes from a similar root as this logizo mai. I've calculated. I've considered. I've done the math. I've come down. I've settled my heart. 
I've landed this thing. That no matter what happens, Jesus is in control. And even if I die today, I will be with him forever. No one can strip me of that. You can't take away the promise of God. He won't let you. But when we lose sight of the long range, it's not hard to get focused right here. It's easy to talk about these things, but when you go home and open your checkbook and it says minus whatever, <laughs> and the phone's ringing because they want some of your minus whatever, it's hard to think about I've got a mansion in glory. <laughs> We'd like to see a real estate agent and maybe trade some of it in. <laughs> Could we get a little ahead of time? Maybe a loan? Take care of the present problems. What comes into question, I think, is, is that we need to be careful of is, is he our father or not? What is my view of God? Not just his promises that won't be taken away, but what, what about himself? Is he my father? The question is, is God working for my good? According to Romans 8.28. We might actually get to that point in this message at some sometime. Is God working for my good? There's so many ways to take that sentence. One, let me encourage us. I don't think he's an employee. Amen. Okay. Is God working for my good? Well, can you handle that paycheck? To make him your, uh, make him your servant? There is that view that God's sort of a, a bellhop. You know, I just, I just go in and ding the bell and perform for me now. That's really a, not a good view. But how about the view of God the Father? Oh, I can feel the collisions. My apologies to some of you. I feel it. I'm being Pentecostal. <laughs> it's there for some of us. You go, Father, just the word is a collision for some of us. I can say, for Peggy and I, that while we had what we believed to be okay relationships with our fathers, it wasn't for long. My father was an abusive alcoholic who beat my mother. My mom took myself and three brothers and we left when I was seven. I only saw him twice after that in my whole life. Once when I went to share Jesus with him and he said, that's nice for you. And the next time was 10 years later when I went to his funeral. Not a good relationship. I don't know, really, from that experience, and some of you are in the same kind of a situation, what it's like. You see, it, hurt, it hurts. And it hurts. You know it hurts. I don't know what it's like in the natural to just climb into the Father's lap and be loved unconditionally. I, d I didn't know. It's not my experience. Some of you come from similar issues where your family of origin is actually a barrier to knowing the love of the Father. I want to encourage you. I do know what it's like now to just See, that's what I'm comfortable with being, you know, what others might think is irreligious or sacrilegious. I, I don't know God as such a distant entity that I can't run in the eminence of God and just say, God, God I, I hurt right now. I hurt right now. And I don't know where to go. And I don't know what to do. And to have him just wrap his arms around me as only he can people help I'm telling you people help you know that too but he can wrap his arms around me and say it's okay if you don't know I do and I've got you or whatever you might hear him say to you maybe different words but it's the same message and we sang some of that again this morning. Oh, he will never let go. He is the pit bull of heaven. 
I mean, he locks on to you and he will not let go of you. And the devil is not his equal. Right? We say light, dark, love, hate. But if we say devil, some people say God, and they say, no, I think I even heard that from Pastor Bill one time. I think, I'm not sure when we were talking about it. It's, they're not equals. They're not opposites. And God will not let the enemy of your soul strip you of his love for you. But you got to hang on. Some of us have, maybe don't have that family father relationship problem, but we've had other failed relationships. We trusted somebody and they hurt us. Or we were married and divorced and something. Or we have abandonment issues. I mean, this isn't a counseling session. I'm just acknowledging that there are numerous issues that come up, fear being one of them. We're afraid. Or as I, I talked to a young lady yesterday, I said, someone's called you independent. May I ask you a question? It'll be a hard question, perhaps. She said, okay, let's try it. I said, are you really independent and a, you know, just able to stand back, be alone, I'm okay by myself? Are you really independent or have you wall, walled yourself in? You got your guards up. And you're not, you look independent, but what it is is you're protecting yourself. Have you thought about it? I wasn't accusing her, I was asking her. And then I left for five minutes to give her time to think, and I came back and I said, well, what did you conclude? She said, I'd never thought about it. But everybody thinks, says I'm independent, but I am walled off. The Lord has shown you. <laughs> wow, isn't that exciting? You're, you're hiding because you've been hurt and you don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> and so you look, I can do this all by myself. Now, here's the difficult part to give you the rest of the picture. She's getting married and I was sitting with her and her fiance. And he's like this. <laughs> like, we've already done the premarital counseling. What's this about? <laughs> Is there more I don't know? You know <laughs> it wasn't like that. They're totally in love. It's just wonderfully weepy, happy stuff. And, and she, I said, well, you're talking about letting him, he's, he's trying to climb the wall. He's trying to get inside. He's going to know you. Are you ready to be known? She said, by him, yes. By some others, no. Whatever the issues are, they, they come up when trouble arrives. When trouble arrives, our view of God gets diminished or we don't have a long enough view that helps us understand we're going somewhere long term. Eternity will come for us. It will all come. I checked. I Googled this morning. Death, death rate, you know, 100%. It's happening. No, no exceptions. No. How many of us will die? All. <laughs> Are you okay with that? It's coming. Eternity. We're signed up. We're going. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You tired of hearing me sniffle? <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, can you mute me for like two seconds? <laughs> this guy's just too real. <laughs> You know, well, first he's taking us to the bathroom, and now he's blowing his nose. What's next? Don't ask. <laughs> yeah, you don't want the answer. Thank you for helping me this morning. I, I, I feel good about being here. I'm really trying not to offend you because I'm coming back next week. <laughs> right? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Oh, guess what that is? That said I was done. <laughs> well, I'm just going to reset it. <laughs> how, how 
how am I going to really, how, come on. We all have problems. We lose our view of God. Myopia sets in, I can't see really the long view. I may have other issues. Golly gee, don't we all have some with abandonment or fear, or relational issues, or I don't have a father, I don't understand how much God loves me yet, I'm growing into it, I want to go further, but whatever the blockades are, but well, so far all I've done is give me the problems. <laughs> and we're in agreement, right, so far? We're in agreement. Well, how do we get through? How do we break through? How can I settle my heart and really believe that when I read this verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. How do I settle that? Or the other version. I mean, there are other versions, other ways of reading it. You know, not, we want to wrestle the, the definitions. Do, okay, do all things? I mean, when I got run over by that truck, was that an all thing that was good for me? Or when I did the surgery, or when I did the loss of life, or when I, my parent, whatever the disaster, the chaos that we sang about was or is, how do I circle that up and say God's working for good? One, God is good. Two, God loves you. Three, He never changes. This is actually a, an issue of dealing with the sovereignty of God. Is he or is he not? Always the same. See, a deistic view is that God put everything in place and then he left town and said to us as his, as his creation, work it out, do the best you can. I'll be back later. It's that distant view. He's not accessible. I, he, I can't call to him for I could cry out in prayer and I should and I should worship him all the demands are on me to do all this stuff to somebody that's not in the neighborhood but that's not a good view sovereign he's, he's not deistic he's right here right now and I can climb in this lap any moment I need to and I should and I should do it often but what when I'm hindered from doing it to be able to get the, the comfort I need and we need it. I need peace. I need comfort. I need help. I need assurance. How do I get there? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you what I believe is an answer, a solution. In Romans, if we go a little bit further, chapter 15, verse 1, it says, We then who are strong ought to bear the scruples or the infirmities or the weaknesses of the weak and not please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification or building up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it's written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. I'll include this. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, and that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. I'm not really well-versed yet, but one of my intrigues is learning how the brain works. I, I know a gentleman who calls himself a neurotheologist. Yeah, that's a nice combination. And he says that in their studies, and they can actually do the little plug-in, monitor your brain, and tell you how much joy you have. That'd be a cool thing. And the reason for that is that joy in our lives is the only thing that develops the, the right prefrontal cortex of our brain that helps us continue to expand our life and mature. Otherwise, we're frozen in time. Now, I won't take this very far because I don't understand it that much. But I do know this. Joy helps Joy helps. Having joy, and joy is much more than just temporal happiness. Joy is knowing things are settled, that God's in control, 
This is more than this, but it's when I am so okay that in the midst of the storm, he's got me all the time. Joy comes. Well, if that's the case, how do I get how do I build up my brain? You will not like this answer. I guarantee it. But it's still truth. And and here it is. We have to go together. You know where joy really comes from? Is spending time with other people. Oh, yeah, but then joy is not the only thing that happens. Sometimes we don't like being with them. Right? Don't forget, those of you who are here all the time, there are visitors checking you out. <laughs> Maybe right this very moment saying, okay, here's this where the rubber meets the road. Joy, I appreciate your laughing at my poor humor. It helps me. But joy comes from being with other people. And when the Bible gives us this kind of prescription, this isn't the only verse, I'm just this kind of proof texting. The way life matures is when the strong help the weak, and the weak and the strong live together. It's how families work. It's not hard. You have adults who are supposed to be mature and help the little ones mature, right? And the strong help the weak. And it works out. But you don't separate them, right? Kids will live on one side of the house, parents on the other, and they just text back and forth. (laughs) Drop emails in on one another. That's kind of getting personal, isn't it? They actually spend time together, and the strong are matured by helping the weak, and the weak are matured because the strong are helping them. And the goal is that the weak will become mature and strong and have their own joy and build up their own right prefrontal cortex and then they will help others the Bible says it this way comfort others with the same comfort you've received when you've matured into the point where you understand how joy works and you like being with people even some you don't really get along with well but you understand your role as the stronger one is to help the weaker one and your joy is fulfilled and their joy is fulfilled and then they help others this system works And it's not just because it's neurotheology. It's Bible. Let those who are strong bear the infirmities and the weaknesses of those who are not strong. Produce joy all around you because everybody's maturing. Everybody's getting closer to the Father. Listen to the scriptures when the psalmist writes and says, you know, I was young and now I'm old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. How many of you question that? You read it and say, come on, really? I've questioned it. I think, oh, I begged a little bread. He didn't live in my neighborhood. We're talking about King David or Asaph, his chief worship leader. They wrote these things. So what am I saying? I'm saying... Have lunch with brother and sister Stowe. Is it okay if I call you that? Sure. Yeah. Why would I say that? I've done it. Well, with him. I didn't get Jan. <laughs> and here's what I went away with. I, I went away with joy. Not just a full tummy. I don't even remember what I ate, brother. But, <laughs> but I remember being with you, and I remember sharing life together over the table. And drinking too much coffee on my part. You remember that too. (laughs) I get real talkative. Can you imagine that? (laughs) He gets additionally talkative? What am I saying? Folks like this, and there are others of you, they've been down the road a ways. They have experiences I don't have. In the natural, in life, in business, and in Jesus. And when I can't find the Father, I can find them. You hear what I'm saying? There's relationships around to be had that says, could we do this together? Because I'm just not doing so well on my own today. Could, I mean, Jim, could you help me? Could we huddle up over there again and get the coffee on? And I'm not sure I know how to do this part of life. 
And if he has a piece of maturity that's already developed and he's got joy in that area of his life and he shares it with me, he'll lift me up. And my joy will be complete. And didn't Jesus tell us that's what he wanted? In me, your joy will be full. Isaiah said it this way, perfect peace. Perfect peace is yours when your mind is stayed on him. I need somebody to help me stay my mind. I don't do it well on my own. So we need to dwell together in community. And maybe that's a worn out phrase. I don't know. Asaph wrote a Psalm 77 and said, you know, I'm going to, I'm, when things get tough, I'm going to rehearse the works of God. We, we, in the hymn, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. It's a, it's a desire to rehearse, to remember. In the last time I had trouble, God showed up. In the last moment when there was an issue that I faced that I couldn't overcome on my own, he sent help. Psalm 20 says he sends help from the sanctuary of God. Sometimes it looks like the person sitting next to you when he sends help. That person comes to encourage you. I was in a meeting on Friday and they started the meeting with just a handful of guys. They said, and we had been together the day before. They said, we need to start today by finishing something we didn't do yesterday. And I thought, wow, I wonder what that was. I guess I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> so I, I did what the Bible says. Even a guy that stays quiet looks smart. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just waited. They'll tell me what it is. And then they turned and said, we need to pray for Jeff. I went, oh, well, that's right. I wasn't paying attention because I was pouring out my heart to these guys. I was the issue. <laughs> that's why I forgot. I said, really? They said, yeah, we need to pray for you. Pulled out the chair, put me in it. Some of you call it the hot seat, whatever. It was a beautiful place to be. And I sat, and I didn't do anything because I couldn't do anything. And they gathered around me, and they took each one a turn, praying God into my life. And what my joy was coming back in the moment. I thought, there's hope. There's hope. And these guys believe there's hope when I don't see it. And they're praying for me right now. And I'm going to leave this place today better than I got here. Where would I have been had I been by myself? Right? And have been saying, is God really working for my good? I would question the Father. I'd let the problems of my past drag into my present and dominate it. And I would have no hope. But instead, the others in their maturity and in their wisdom, and in, they looked and said, time to bear the infirmities of the weak. And the weak was not rebellious. I just said, give me the chair. Pray for me. That was page nine. No matter what's on page nine, that was page nine. We need to close. Is there anything else we need to do? To f we have a song. Oh, I hope it's a happy one. Don't you? I kind of hope it's a happy one. It's got a lot of hellfire. Or <laughs> more chaos on your life. Today we sing you out the door, and it's going to be miserable and horrible. No. Okay, we're at risk at this point because I don't know the song is, but then let me pray. Kind of an uh, overarching prayer. And may I say this to some of you specifically and, and hopefully it resonates with you because from where I stand, I get to see all your faces while we're talking. And I've seen some of your responses and I know some of you are hurting. I just know that. It's not hard to see. I've been transparent with you and in my transparency you have been transparent back and I thank you for that because what it does it puts me off of this <laughs> right down here with where we live right we're in this together and I'm not going to make it without you and you're not going to make it without somebody else 
We're in it together. That's why it's called a body. You know, every description of the church in Scripture is about something that's put together. Cities, flocks of sheep, bodies, a marriage, husband and wife. It's always something that only works when it's put together. We isolate ourselves and then we end up asking this question. Is God really working for my good? He can't unless you're co-joined to the body. Unless you're willing to be at risk, be vulnerable, and be honest with somebody. And please, may I encourage the ones who are going to be called on, don't mess it up. You know, this isn't a gossip factory, right? This isn't time to, to work on them and make it worse. It's time for your strength to bear the burden of the week. Father, I'm so glad I can call you that this morning. And while I know you're the heavenly Father, and that suggests that you may be distant, that you've chosen not to be distant, that you are imminent, you are present. Father, I thank you that you love me and you love us. You love every single one of us here personally, intimately, and you know our thoughts and you know our hurts, you know our woundings. And you are in charge of your promises. I ask that you would lift us today in your strength to a place where our dependency is no longer on our own thoughts, but they're on your word. They're settled in your scriptures that you have a plan for us that's good and you're going to bring it to pass. Help us to quiet our minds more often and truly think through things so that even in our bodies we can live at peace. Minister to us, I pray, spirit, soul, and body in Jesus' name. And I offer you this